machines for Grasshopper were utilized, particularly procedural compute and butterfly for Grasshopper, basically to verify infrared. Python-based machine learning model enabling quick wind prediction. A zone sized 2.5 times 2.5 kilometers was selected to demonstrate the existing wind situation in this larger urban scale. As can be seen on the wind roll, the northerly winds prevail in Kurdistan. Therefore, this wind direction is used in the CFD simulations. The terrain is not considered in the simulations because the infrared tool has not yet been trained to work with the terrain morphology. Also, as is displayed at the bottom figure, we must use simplified and closed mesh geometry for testing. In the analysis, the input wind speed is 10 meters per second and the wind direction 0 degrees representing northerly winds. Here, you can see the results of the machine learning prediction versus CFD analysis of the large urban zone displayed at the pedestrian level. The idea was to demonstrate the capability of fast wind prediction through infrared and confirm the output with a standard yet progressive Grasshopper CFD plugin. On the left side, there is an output from the infrared wind flow prediction. The overall process of wind prediction took less than 30 seconds. On the right side, we have the output from the cloud-based CFD analysis through procedural compute. Naturally, computing an area this big through computational fluid dynamics demands enhanced computer parameters, as well as long runtime. Therefore, we chose this cloud-based option. Although the two outputs cannot be compared directly, uh, only through colors, we can identify similar predictions for wind acceleration and turbulence in both. The zones with higher wind speed are framed. We picked one of the frame zones to demonstrate the influence of wind-based urban designing in a 500 times 500 meters neighborhood. Zone one was prognosticated with both analysis tools to have large regions of accelerated wind between the existing buildings and a turbulent flow downstream. The figure on the left shows the prediction with infrared. The CFD analysis of the same area depicted in the figure on the right is performed in Butterfly for Grasshopper, which is based similarly to procedural compute on the open foam platform. The wind situation appears to be calmer than predicted with infrared. The iterative process of wind-based urban designing is performed with the previously verified wind prediction tool, infrared. Instead of the old printing factory here, apartment building with office spaces on the first floors will be designed. In the design process, we have intertwined the parametric design through Grasshopper with the real-time wind analysis of various urban design options. The parametric constraints were the following, the height from 9 to 18 meters and the building orientation angle from minus 15 to 15 degrees. The footprint and the, and the number of the buildings were altered according to the designer's ideas. There were two design goals, creating a comfortable urban space and supporting the natural ventilation around buildings. Six design options and their performance in the wind can be seen in the picture on the right. Following the design goals, option 3B was selected as the best one. 
through the urban case study in Slovakia, the iterative wind-based designing using infrared and two grasshopper CFD plugins has enabled fast wind-based optimization of the urban configuration in the early design phase. With the proposed design approach, we can seamlessly and quickly predict the impact of the wind flow on the future designs and reciprocally leverage building morphology for enhancing the quality of the environment, for example, by addressing stagnant wind flow while providing outdoor wind comfort. In future work, the eventual design will pick up on the wind optimized urban configuration and introduce fluid architectural shapes into the concept. Their function as a wind catcher and a sun shading system will be examined and evaluated closely, employing CFD grasshopper plugins. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lenka and the team. And uh, now we can go to the next uh, presentation. Let's see. Hello, I'm I think it's, sorry. I think it's this one from Vesa. Are you there? Or uh, someone from the team, maybe? Okay. Um, well, anyways, uh, we, we can see the video and take some notes and then uh, we can go to, to the question to see if they are there. Let me know if you can see or hear the video. Hello, I'm Pisa Nakocha from Stanford. Yes. This morning we started collaboratively with Associate Professor Dr. Samala Chow. And your research we present is about pixel based geometric decoding of modular compositions. This study explores the use of a computational method for decoding and encoding and art composition in the digital environment. In the context of this method, we use geometric decoding concept in terms of subdivision through color and shape of modular compositions. The method is then reached out to enable the artworks to be compared according to the main composition. Modular style is one of the entire similar subjects studied continuously in the development of scientists. We don't hear anything. And nineteen forty three at the Nikers and Digital Design. Sorry, there was a problem with the audio. Yes, there was a problem. Now it's okay. Okay. The process of separating a whole into geometric parts horizontally and vertically offers a quantitative decoding alternative. For this comparison process, a novel and simple pixel based decoding method was suggested. Within the scope of the study, we selected five artworks completed between 1938 and uh, 1943 at the Cassie of the Right. In the research, we use P5JS and open source JavaScript library called decoding. And the base of the comparison concept is the data of matrix based calculations. And uh, you can see in the di diagram, we try to create a flow to follow as a method. First, in the segmentation, you know, all geometric components with the same color in the composition are considered as a whole. In the composition consisting of red, blue, yellow, and black and white colors, the percentage in the color usage drive from the pixels, regardless of the position and form of the components. And secondly, the fragmentation method was used. Regarding the uh, fragmentation method, the 
composition was considered as a whole, and each painting the user was allowed to create as many horizontal or vertical fragments as desired. To also be present two approaches here, PSA and CCA, particle comparison approaches based on a calculation of numerical difference between pixel values by creating binary combinations of any number of paintings. A common composition approach, and on the other hand, such the arithmetic average of each calculated matrix. And this is the general algorithm of that we used for the pixel-based analysis. It basically includes the information of while controlling the pixels according to the five colors in the competitions. A difference of 50 pixels was determined in the RGB bodies in order to reduce the error margin of the algorithm. Since the pixel locations in the painting are eliminated, all pixels in the XRM I coordinates are in control. The distribution of five colors used in the modern sky in the artwork selected for the work corresponds to a uh, five to five matrix. Fragment width is determined by the user input, and in the scope of the study, fragment division input was taken as 20. And this is the visualized version of the matrix generated with the segmentation method and common composition approach. Although this method doesn't produce original information, it offers an important output in terms of ensuring the algorithmic control of the equation information. The paintings decoded with fragmentation method enabled a more comprehensive analysis. And the matrix, including the comparative result of the first three images shown in the figure middle here. Uh, the matrix comparison values in the vertical direction for each fragment number show the difference for each horizontal fragment of the painting, number one and two, number two and three, and number one and three, respectively. Uh, according to the visual encoding, it's seen that the difference between painting number one and two and the painting number two and three is quite high in the first five fragments. Besides the light colors in the fragments, and 10, 11, and 12 indicate that these fragments contain values close to each other, which means these threads in the paintings are much more similar. For F out, you see shown on the right uh, in the figure, is a visual pair paired with the fragmentation method and common composition approach. This comparison is only the comparison of number one painting with the common composition average obtained from five paintings in horizontal fragments. Uh, one of the striking points is the abundance of places that are very close to white. That's completely suitable for the composition. This is the vertical fragments of the output according to the user input. You can see the first six fragments contain dark colors. This means that vertically it contains different color pixels in areas close to the starting coordinate of the composition. As a result of this proposition of these two data, this matrix was generated. A red color overlay is applied to the grayscale output that represents the horizontal fragment differences. Uh, the blue color is assigned to the visual of the vertical fragment in these two different colors. This proposition table, the purple color scale was automatically created according to the uh, intensity of the color. We can also compare the relative similarity of a selected artwork to different artworks based on the percentage of fragment-based color usage differences in the comparison table number one, number two, and number three color differences in multiple fragments. The percentage of total usage differences of red, blue, yellow, black, and white colors in 24 vertical fragments is shown. In this table, we can say that number two artwork is more similar to number one in terms of using red in vertical practice and uh, more similar to number three in using yellow. The use of blue, black, and white is quite close to each other in percentage. So, computational scientists that can be used in the production of digital artworks of being created new concepts and perspectives. The use of computational analysis methods also has the potential to reinforce current issues such as image processing and machine learning. It's expected the result of the study can contribute new ideas regarding shape computing. Since uh, only five artworks have been used in the study, the numerical values found present a limited value. In the future, it's possible to uh, make more precise comparison by increasing the number of artworks included in the algorithm. These are the references.
Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fisa and Sema. I, I think I forgot to to tell the names. Uh, this paper, pixel-based geometric decoding of Mondrian composition, is from uh, Fisa Noor uh, Kosha Osgun from the Istanbul, Te Istanbul uh, Technical University of uh, Turkey, and Sema Alacham from Istanbul Technical University of Turkey also. So now I think uh, the order should be, let me check the next one, should be, uh, yeah, uh, recoding post-war Syria. And um, maybe if the authors are here, they can share the video because we didn't receive it. So yeah, I will stop I'll, share, I'll share I will the, stop the presentation. And I think you are due, I think you have to be able to share. Yes. Okay, Can you see great. It? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, uh, let me, let so let, let me read the, the, the title and the authors and then you can play your own video. Thank you. Uh, so the next um, video or paper is uh, Recoding Post-War Syria, the role of data collection and objective investigations in post-war mm -hmm. smart city from uh, Amziwar Al-Nuri from the Reparamatriz uh, Foundation of Innsbruck, uh, Bilal Baghdadi also from the Reparamatriz Foundation and Nairus uh, Khatib. Yes. also from the Reparamatrice Foundation. So uh, I hope I pronounced the names almost uh, like... <laughs> yeah. That's fine. So uh, it's all yours. Yeah. Hello, everyone. It was perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. So do you hear me? The sound is good, no? Yes, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so the research is like recording post-war Syria. It's an ongoing research and data platform focused on the innovation and collecting comprehensive infrastructure and socio-economic analytics synchronization data by using AI driven to give a more transparent image of innovating a new methodology to regenerate the future of post-war smart city into an advanced and sustainable urban environment in a smarter way. The pressure to achieve a rapid post-war smart city without clear strategy and comprehensive analysis of all aspects will cause a particularly so traffic collapse in the interconnected social structural services, education and health care system, leaving a long term impact on the society. This paper is present the current status of the research and documentation methodology in the data collection phase by the objective investigation conducted through a series of local and inter international workshops besides developed in, the, in this research, which we call recording, offering consequent and direct ground survey, statistic and documentation study of the targeted area, merging professionalism and use power with the local community to detect and open source data use a tool to regenerate a precious area toward a new methodology. One of the workshops which we have done, I mean, like in 2018, in collaboration with the Faculty of Architecture in Damascus University, it was like uh, Al Ghuta East. The approach of this workshop was to work on one area was partially damaged by the war and later applying this morphology on the other area of Syria. The workshop methodology implies two aspects. First is the building uh, survey experiment to produce and present analytical data of the local community in the damage area affected by the war, understanding their social structure, daily life, struggle, need, and expectation. Second is documenting the affected area and analyzing their characteristic of the circulation, social structure, infrastructure, structural situation, and urban fabric by using 3D scanning technology and collecting and sharing data that the student have gathered through mapping distracted region. This experience can nevertheless reflect lifestyle and inhabitant and the need of the local people in every district uh, visited. So I will give the mic now to Bilal. Uh, yes, hello everyone. Okay, so in order to uh... Following to what Zewar said, uh, we make two also many workshops in, uh, for the 
this uh, recording research. Uh, it was later. Uh, it was a collaboration between workshop between Reaper and Rice Foundation and Fan Art Institute in Belgium, China. This workshop explored the vision of foreign students to understand the current structural conditions of the destruction, the financial and demographic conditions, and come up with a sustainable strategy to regenerate the district of the Malka neighborhood in Damascus, Syria. Then uh, the method in the workshop was to develop the case study project and addressing the existing fabric and damage building process is based on 3D scanning technology, scanning damages building to understand the current structural conditions and develop a reconstruction strategy for the building concentrate, considering the structure. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, considering the structural conditions yeah. and develop the reconstruction strategy for the building considering the structure strengthening and architectural planning. This data was contributed to the development as a structural analysis model of the destructions. The recording of the eco children was an online experience interacting to Reap and Trace Foundation with the University of Hamburg, having set in the educational summer course. This course focused on rethinking the methodologies and the results of temporary architectural practice in affected environments. An essential part of the course was designed inspired by the vision of children who gave students idea through their beautiful colors and sketches would express their needs of space for living and communications. Besides optimization students, knowledge about the reviewing materials as essential means of current view of post-war reconstruction. The research scope, local materials in Syria and materials and patients, and development trends from advanced high tech to low tech basic approach. Yes. And moving to the last course of recording, the Mascos dialogues. So, this project is conceived as a collaborative work between the Parameters Foundation and the Applied Foreign Affairs Lab within the Institute of Architecture at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna and the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Damascus. And so the research investigates new ways in which architecture can participate in community building in a post-war urban context. And the main question is, if spatial interventions at a small scale strategically dispersed can instigate community building by occupying the fabric of the existing building in various states of desolation and destruction, um, so the interventions connect a network of public rooms that attempt to bring communal life back to the street. And uh, the research uh, includes a set of objective investigations consisting of three main topics. First, urbanism in public places, second, ecology, and the last one is magic. So each, each of the three studies seeks to find and design its own methodology where there's a set of tools and distinctive inputs for each research which in turn leads to a set of various outputs, visual, cartographic, photographic models, audio, and so on. And uh, to conclude, the research presented in this paper aims to form a wide vision regarding post-war smart city development and give a more transparent image of innovating a new methodology to, re to regenerate post-war cities by unifying mind, working hands, local community, um, using consequent objective investigations, direct ground survey statistics and documentation study of the targeted areas and using renowned ways instead of ordinary rebuilding practices to encourage refugees to return and rebuild their society, economy and homes. And thank you. Thank you, Nairus, and thank you all. And now we can go to the last video. Um, There is, um, let's see. Uh, what can colors and shapes tell about uh, generative adversarial networks from Professor Dr. Kanuzung from Altingbach University. Um, he tell us that he cannot be here, but uh, we will present the video anyways. 
My paper topic is what can colors and shapes tell about generative adversarial networks? With the potential and power of visual data generation of GAN, the number of research on GAN with the visual arts and architecture has increased. Despite the various studies on GAN in design field, there are few studies on the evaluation of GAN's working process, its output, its relation between the training data sets. So this paper focuses on colors and shapes and their relation with GAN and efficiency to understand the nature of data separation for design problems. Why colors and textural shape qualities are important? Because human perceives and experiences the architecture space with these colors and textural features. In terms of architectural data set, I want to focus on color and textural features. So it is really important for architectural experience as well. These architectural properties give the characteristic of architecture. Color and textural properties are inseparable from qualities of architecture. Not only the color and textural qualities affect the characteristic of and per perceptual experience of architecture space, but also characteristic and perceptual features of data set of a data set for ground will be affected. And because of this reason, training results and output and the efficiency of GAN will be affected as well. For this um, evaluation of the colors and shapes in training sessions in GAN, GAN algorithm, six different training sessions with three data sets I conducted. And then these data sets with different complex, I choose data sets with different complex, color complexity, shape complexity, and different texture complexity levels. I use two different algorithms called this again and context decoder. The colors and the shape textual complexities of data sets analyzed before the training session. After the training session, the outputs and the training processes are compared and evaluated. Here is the color, uh, here is the three different data sets. First one is the uh, circle data set by El Corsi. Red, red color repeating geometric pattern data set can be seen here. And here is the Devrim Arab with example of drug red data set. Each uh, data set containing 300 images inside of it. Here is the data set analysis of the color complexities and the shape complexities. For color complexity, heuristically, what I perceived I analyzed, actually we can count the number of colors for pure image complexity. For example, bigger and ground has only two colors for the circle data set, so it, the number is two. But for the pattern data set, each page, each page for the, each image has only one color, has one, one red color, but in the data set, we have all we have more than two colors for the complexity for the entire data set we have more than two colors for the entire data set for the pattern data set i have only one color but for the data set we have more than two colors for the shape complexity i use gray level coherence method which is a common method to analyze the textural information of the images so here we can see the gray level coherence metric central piece of the data sets and the layered distribution per image. So we can see that the Hessian data set has a regular distribution, while the Arabic data set has the highest value for the gray level coherence metric, while the circle data set has the lowest gray level coherence metric entropy level. So here is the algorithm, uh, algorithm architecture, as you can see. Uh, on the left hand side, we have this again on the right, context and code architecture. For this again and the context and code, we have generated discriminate functions. For generated functions in this again, I use convolutional 2D transpose layers. For the discriminated function, I use convolutional 2D. While in the context and code, I use generator and discriminator. And for the generated function, I use encoder and decoder functions inside the generated function. For the encoder convolutional 2D transpose layers, I use, but for the decoder, I use upsampling, upsampling instead of convolutional 2D transpose. For the discriminator, it is really similar to the discriminator of this again, so I use convolutional 2D function. For, while the DCGAN is generating the whole image, the context encoder is only generating the mass part of the image. So I'm giving a mass part on the image, so if the context encoder predicting this, this mass part of the image. While evaluating the results of this decision and context encoder, I use heuristic evaluation and press the threshold inception uh, distance score evaluation. Here is the uh, training experiment results by with decision and context encoder. I trained the algorithm with 1,000 epochs in uh, Google Collaboratory using Python uh, coding language. Here is the result can be seen. And here, uh, while this again is creating the whole image, as you can see in the context encoded, only the mass parts are uh, generated and they are blurry. Heuristic evaluation results. Uh, let's look at the heuristic evaluation results. I use actually for the color evaluation.
evaluation two points uh, like skill, but while using this shape evaluation, shape uh, result, I use three point like skill. As you can see, for this color uh, generation, I use successful for one, unsuccessful for two, and for the best one in the shape generation, I use two, for the worst one, I use two, uh, zero. As you can see, this again is the most unsuccessful one, while the best one was uh, pattern data set generation in the color and the shape generation in the CPN algorithm. But in the context encoder, for the color, as you can see, context encoder is better than the uh, DCGAN while generating the colors because they are all successful. Uh, but in the shape generation, again, the pattern data set shape generation is the most successful in context encoder. But the, the shape generation success, uh, the worst successful one, is changing according to the C. A algorithm, and as you can see, shapes cannot be generated in DC again. In circle shapes, cannot be generated in DC again, while in context and other shapes, circle shapes can be uh, generated. But the remainder data set cannot be generated in terms of shapes, but the blue colors can be seen. When it comes to the precious inception distance evaluation, we have this graph according to the uh, approach. We can see how the precious inception distance are changing. But merely looking at these graphs, we cannot say anything because, as you can see, the VCN has the lowest speed score. So we can say that according to these graphs, VCN Azure is the most successful one, but it is not enough for us. For this one, the different data set is the most successful one. We need to see the difference in between the starting epoch and the final epoch with precious inception distance. As you can see, here is the uh, first difference is created exception distance differences between first and last epoch, and we can see that the bigger uh, difference is for the patent data that can occur here. So we can say that in terms of precious inception distance, context encoder is the best one with the patent data set. But in this again, the patent data set again the most successful one as we can see the difference between first and the last epoch. Range and inception distance has the biggest value. So, according to these things, results are saying that effects of color in the CDN training, color complexity affects color generation. In context and color, color complexity for the entire data set is not that much important as the algorithm is focusing on the context of the single image. So, context and color is better than the CDN in generating colors regardless of color complexity. We can understand that algorithm has an important role in generating color. Effect of shape, according to heuristic and fit for precious inception distance score evaluation, the pattern data set gets the highest score in this scan and context encoder sessions, even the pattern data that has the second biggest grade level coherence metric entropy value. The DLCN entropy results show that there is no direct relationship between the numeric DLCN entropy value, GL. CM entropy values with the algorithm output. Instead, the distribution of the GLCM entropy values affects training. GLCM distribution of the pattern data set has a regular change. Results show that the color and the shape complexities are critical for selecting the data set for GAN, GAN training session. Color complexity has negative correlation between the CGAN output success. But the correlation is weak in context encoder rather than the numeric shape complexity values. Regularity in GLCM distribution affects the algorithm positively. According to these uh, results, actually we can ask three important questions for architectural data set generation. What kind of color complexities do we have in architectural data set? Is it possible to create a regular GLCM distributed data set of architecture? Is the regularity a threat for trade creating the same ecological output for architecture with GAN algorithm? So, thank you. Hi, all. I'm Jonathan. My paper topic is What can color it? And well, okay. Well, thank you, Pam. Um, I think it's a pity that he cannot be here because uh, I'm seeing some relationship between his paper and the paper about Mondrian, but let's uh, move on. 
Uh, I think that the first video didn't broadcast uh, through YouTube. So if you all agree, I can put the, the first video again to the people in, in YouTube to see it. To see it. Uh, do you agree? I think we, we have yes. some minutes for, for the discussions uh, like half an hour. So we are, we are okay for, uh, let's, let's try. So let's try this. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I think it's this one. Anything yeah. so. Yeah. So, again. Uh, leveraging urban configurations from uh, for achieving wind comfort in cities uh, from Lenka Kibosheba, Angelos Kronis, Theodoros Galanos, and Dusan Katunski. Greetings to all. I'm Lenka Kibosheba, a postdoc at the Technical University of Košice, Slovakia. The paper originated from the collaboration with the Austrian Institute of Technology, specifically their City Intelligence Lab. This joint project demonstrates our view of architectural engineering that can contribute to the climate change adaptation efforts and even help mitigate extreme weather events through climate related planning in the early design phase. Employing computational fluid dynamics simulations already during the conceptual design stage, the unfavorable wind effects such as accelerated wind or turbulence created by the urban configuration can be identified and addressed. Furthermore, through urban and architectural wind-oriented design, the wind can be leveraged for benefits of natural ventilation or even dispersing pollutants and reducing urban heat island effect. Despite these benefits, CFD simulations are still not fully integrated into architectural practice. The seamless integration of the wind flow analysis into urban design was tested through the case study located in Košice, Slovakia. A mixture of techniques was employed in the process. Two CFD plugins for Grasshopper were utilized, particularly procedural compute and butterfly for Grasshopper, basically to verify infrared. A Python based machine learning model enabling quick wind prediction. A zone sized 2.5 times 2.5 kilometers was selected to demonstrate the existing wind situation in this larger urban scale. As can be seen on the wind roads, the northerly winds prevail in Košice. Therefore, this wind direction is used in the CFD simulations. The terrain is not considered in the simulations because the infrared tool has not yet been trained to work with the terrain morphology. Also, as is displayed at the bottom figure, we must use simplified and closed mesh geometry for testing. In the analysis, the input wind speed is 10 meters per second, and the wind direction zero degrees, representing northerly winds. Here, you can see the results of the machine learning prediction versus CFD analysis of the large urban zone displayed at the pedestrian level. The idea was to demonstrate the capability of fast wind prediction through infrared and confirm the output with a standard yet progressive grasshopper CFD plugin. On the left side, there is an output from the infrared wind flow prediction. The overall process of wind prediction took less than 30 seconds. On the right side, we have the output from the cloud-based CFD analysis through procedural compute. Naturally, computing an area this big 
through computational fluid dynamics demands enhanced computer parameters, as well as long runtime. Therefore, we chose this cloud-based option. Although the two outputs cannot be compared directly, uh, only through colors, we can identify similar predictions for wind acceleration and turbulence in both. The zones with higher wind speed are framed. We picked one of the framed zones to demonstrate the influence of wind-based urban designing in a 500 times 500 meters neighborhood. Zone one was prognosticated with both analysis tools to have large regions of accelerated wind between the existing buildings and a turbulent flow downstream. The figure on the left shows the prediction with infrared. The CFD analysis of the same area depicted in the figure on the right is performed in Butterfly for Grasshopper, which is based similarly to procedural compute on the open foam platform. The wind situation appears to be calmer than predicted with infrared. The iterative process of wind-based urban designing is performed with the previously verified wind prediction tool, infrared. Instead of the old printing factory here, apartment buildings with office spaces on the first floors will be designed. In the design process, we have intertwined the parametric design through Grasshopper with the real-time wind analysis of various urban design options. The parametric constraints were the following, the height from 9 to 18 meters and the building orientation angle from minus 15 to 15 degrees. The footprint and the, uh, the number of the buildings were altered according to the designer's ideas. There were two design goals, creating a comfortable urban space and supporting the natural ventilation around buildings. Six design options and their performance in the wind can be seen in the picture on the right. Following the design goals, mm -hmm. option 3B was selected as the best one. Through the urban case study in Slovakia, the iterative wind-based designing using infrared and two Grasshopper CFD plugins has enabled fast wind-based optimization of the urban configuration in the early design phase. With the proposed design approach, we can seamlessly and quickly predict the impact of the wind flow on the future designs and reciprocally Leverage building morphology for enhancing the quality of the environment, for example, by addressing stagnant wind flow while providing outdoor wind comfort. In future work, the eventual design will pick up on the wind optimized urban configuration and introduce fluid architectural shapes into the concept. Their function as a wind catcher and a sun shading system will be examined and evaluated closely, employing CFD grasshopper plugins. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, now we can go to the comments and questions. But first of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Rodrigo Martin Iglesias from the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. And with me is uh, Mauro Chiarella from the University of uh, Litoral in Santa Fe, Argentina also. Um, and first <coughs> of all, uh, do you have a, a question or comment for uh, one of your colleagues uh, or uh, peers here? I mean, the other authors? Um, if you don't, we have... We have several questions. 
and comments. Mauro? Yes. Uh, uh, hi. Again, translate uh, your question. Okay. I have a question for Lenka. Is it possible? <laughs> yes, yes, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, how you how how you take the real 3D data of the wind direction, uh, wind guru, sensor, and hit point? Sorry, once again, please. Sí, eh, lo digo español y me traduce aquí en inglés. Yeah, well, I will try. Eh, yeah. Sí, ¿cómo toma los cómo, cómo toma los datos reales en 3D si es que los toma eh, de la dirección del viento con wind guru o con sensores en puntos claves? Okay. Más allá de la predicción, so, si hay una toma de datos take... reales. Yeah, uh, the the um... The data set of, of the real um, wind 3D. direction. Yeah, mm -hmm. 3D wind uh, 3D. direction and points. How do you take the real data? Is from wind guru or which, which one was the other one, uh, Moro? O, 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 o puntos, eh, sensores dispersos en puntos claves. Ah, yeah. ¿no? Or, or, or sensors, sensors in, key, in points. In key, point. or, uh, key point yeah. sensors oh. in... in in, in the building. The, yeah, in the buildings or something yeah. like that. I am usually using the data from Energy Plus website. Okay. So there are measurements uh, that go back 10 years. And it's, I think, every, every day, I think it's uh, integrated into the measurements. And then I take the average. I generate uh, the windrows in uh, Grasshopper using Ladybug. And I, I take it from there. I don't use uh, the sensors. Okay. For okay. the for the let's say the the current data of, of the actual wind. Something no, like that. no, no. I use prevailing winds in in the okay. location I design. Okay. So I it's think. more like a statistical, in a way. Yes, you're right. Yeah, because it's usually like that. For example, in Košice, uh, we have really these northerly winds prevailing and no other direction is that distinct. So that's why. Right. Great. <laughs> uh, thank you. So uh, Mauro, do you have uh, another question or comment? Uh, no, it, 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 la pregunta era porque you translate, eh, Rodrigo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sí. Sí, aquí en, San, aquí en Santa Fe hacemos deportes de, de viento, eh, kitesurf, y los datos de Winguru no siempre son reales. Hay un margen, este, que, un margen de error este, yeah. considerable. Yeah. yeah, he he was asking because in in, in Santa Fe, uh, their city, um, they uh, used to to do um, wind sports, let's say, like kite surf, and the data from wind guru is not uh, reliable, you know, uh, <laughs> it has a little uh, error tolerance there, so that's why he's asking. Yeah, you can uh, try this Energy Plus website, maybe have a look there to compare. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. So uh, I was actually, I, I have a question for, for you also, um, because uh, I was thinking when, when you pres uh, was presenting, I was thinking if, if uh, Kosice really has a, a problem with wind or it's just your city and you're starting with your city. And then maybe because we have here, for example, in Argentina, uh, let's say an area, a, a little problematic regarding wind in, in the Patagonia. And um, and also I can think, for example, of uh, Chicago with uh, famous winds and, and so on. So I'm thinking about if it's really a problematic place or it's just a place to start to, to, to use this tool. I would say both because okay. I'm from Košice, yes, but also uh, it's a problematic city in terms of wind flow. And uh, it really depends um, on the building configuration. Uh, we have a lot of um, apartment blocks from the socialistic uh, times. 
mm -hmm. uh, and they are like uh, eight to 12 floors uh, and very closely uh, placed closely to each other. And that's why the wind uh, accelerates in between them. And also uh, the city is in the, in the well, valley, valley. So uh, also this um, contributes to the wind acceleration. So yes, there are problems and I would like to um, probably use architecture to solve it, <laughs> to solve them. Great, thank you. Well, I have uh, at least two more questions, but well, I want to go to other teams, um, uh, uh, especially uh, now uh, to Sema's team about the, this uh, pixel um, or pixelization of, of uh, Mondrian and how to, to, to understand that this, this I like the 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 metric the matrix based uh, calculation, um, but I was thinking about this uh, concept of of machine or computational creativity. You know what I mean? Because we are dealing here with uh, art and also with computational analysis and and simulation. So. Um, are you there? <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear me? I think she froze. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, we can we can follow later with that. Um, yeah. So I have another question for uh, the team of uh, the Postcode Smart City. Um, I think it's a very interesting, interesting work. Uh, above all, I think it's uh, it's a very interesting approach. Um, and I have several questions. One is uh, about the um, the social structure and the three D scanning on how do you uh, connect those? Because, I mean, you can make a 3D scanning of the buildings and uh, and you can make some kind of, uh, I don't know, surveys or interviews for the social uh, structure or social fabric to, to know about that, to, to gather some data. But how do you connect those? I, I, I mean, because I, they are different very different kind of, of data sets. Uh, yes, uh, regarding the connection, you mean <clears throat> how to connect the, the structure conditions for the buildings and with the, with what exactly? Because you, you said in the video that you gather two different kinds of information. One is from the building itself, like structural, yes strength yes. or something like that and the other one is from the social structure like the social fabric or networks or so on so how do you connect those to to redesign the city if, yes. if you have two inputs that are very different yes uh, we used uh, two uh, two, uh, two formulas one is this 3d scanning device we scan all the uh, buildings, the structures, and etc. And this data, which we get it from the 3D scanning, we analyze it with the softwares that while we these buildings are standing till now, like there is the beams, there's column missing in the building, and of course we this of uh, this data actually we discuss it with the consultant of the structures engineer and. Uh, and globally, I mean, in the city in Syria, Lebanon, globally, we discuss this data and start with how to, for example, we implement this, this data on the building in Samarka that half demolished in the building, that we see that this building, we don't need to demolish, actually. It can be, uh, we can solve, actually, the structure by adding a, uh, by adding a system. We create a system that we can support the existing structure and the, uh, without demolishing the building. So this data, we collect it from the city scanning and we discuss it and make a lot of discussion actually with the session engineers. 
Yes. And I think not demolishing um, the whole building, it can relate and connect to the identity uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the people there. But they, I don't think they want that, they don't want the demolishing their homes or their, the, the, their structures. Yeah, I can see that uh, like a symbolic or emotive kind of uh, significance. Uh, I can see that. Uh, it's a symbol absolutely. of resistance also. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that. And, and, and I have an, another question for, for you. That is, you, you, you are using the, the concept smart cities, but uh, I'm asking myself if you are talking about another kind of smart here, like another way to understand how a city can be smart, because you're not using the, the traditional uh, ways to, to understand a, a smart city, you know what I mean? Uh, the more, let's say, hegemonic ways to understand on a, on a smart city. It's like you are using the concept of, of smart for this redesigning um, in a way. It's a, like a redesigning with some sort of caring about the city. Um, but I'm interested in how do you understand the concept of smart here? Actually, there's a two way for the smart how we implement actually in our in our research actually first that we come up with the smart actually smart ideas and smart concepts for for the existing conditions of the inhabitants over there because all the all the cities over there was demolished and like infrastructure demolished structure there's a lot of uh, damages over there so one of the smart uh, things that we included that we use the existing uh, traditional material to create another, to create a new material with mixing with the high-tech material. For example, like there's a lot of rubbers over there. So we mix the rubbers with the, like uh, high-tech materials like polyurethane, like SPR, like acrylic things. And this, this material can be, can be used to be structured and, and can be used to be cladding like the course the workshop we make it with the uh, edge Gavante in New Germany that they have in half universe in Germany we develop four materials using traditional materials you can use it for structure wise or you can use it for cladding other things that we use it for the smart like we use the sustainable and the smart technique for the uh, ventilation for the air because there, over there there's no infrastructure actually so we use a smart technique and using the tradition also expert expertise over there and we use this uh, we create these smart things like the turbine that generate the electricity because infrastructure is already damaged we uh, we also create uh, some wind collector to also generate the electricity for the also to the, to bring the water to the city so these smart things we either we created because because of the condition over there and also we use smart smart devices to collect the data from there and uh, adapt these that adapt these uh, devices and these smart things how to create the life over there because almost it's now it's, there's a lot of obstacles in the city how to rebuild it actually that's why we call recording that that to use the local people and local materials in a smart way to rebuilding their cities with their identities with their with their experience with their experience actually we don't want to remove the identity of the city each city has its own uh, identity so there's a sm like many smart things smart techniques smart materials smart uh, uh, concepts we use it to create this environment okay, and, uh, okay. May I? Yeah. Yeah. please and I think the term smart could be could relate also to the traditional houses or, or to the traditional techni techniques and how we can modernize it to become in a, to, in, a, in a smarter way. But all the all the qualities and the traditional house and the Damascene traditional house and all the things and and to take it to another level in a smarter way or to modernize it, but to take it in consideration. Great, great. No, that's because I. I you know that uh, most of the time when you talk about the materials or even um, vernacular architecture or something like that, uh, usually, usually 
um, uh, usually we talked about uh, intelligence and not maybe smartness. Uh, I don't know, it's a matter of, of semantics there. But uh, when you talk about smart cities, most of the time you are talking about something related to cybernetics and to feedback uh, yes. and, and yes. some kind of um, automation, uh, automation and, some, uh, and so on. So it's just a matter of, of, of semantics and, and how do you understand the concept? It's just like that. Uh, thank you. And so, uh, Sema, are you there? Uh, are you listening to me? Sure, I have been listening all the time. Sorry for the connection problem. No, uh, no, 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 not at all. I, I was asking you if, um, I mean, I, I, I think it was very interesting. Uh, how do you use uh, uh, this matrix-based uh, calculation and, and the segmentation and so on? But um, talking about um, machine or computational creativity, I mean, uh, you are dealing with art and at the same time with, uh, with computation. And, and how do you understand this, let's say, ability or capability of a computer to be creative? Um, thank you for this question, uh, Rodrigo. Um, actually, um, we have been dealing with only a few dimensions of segmentation of a, a whole. And then understanding uh, some sub-relations. And um, in our case, uh, pixels were the uh, smallest elements of a composition. Uh, so their proportions, inner relations, uh, and uh, patterns, if uh, there were any, uh, were some kind of uh, part of this uh, top-down segmentation. Uh, actually, uh, relating to the creativity, maybe an integration of a nonlinear system might be more meaningful in that uh, case, um, which uh, goes beyond our perception. Um, maybe a um, bottom-up system, um, which includes um, not necessarily, but maybe cellular automata or another kind of um, ways which um, indicate a kind of nonlinear system might be a, one of the first steps of dealing with creativity. Uh, maybe uh, uh, what, um, uh, let's say, goes beyond our perception or our ability uh, might be related to the uh, concept of creativity in, uh, in the way we approached uh, the art works. Okay, much more clear. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hi, so Mauro, hi. you have, yeah, I was asking you. <laughs> one question, um, Asima. Eh, dos preguntas, Rodrigo, tú tra yeah. traduces. Yep. ¿Qué diferencia tiene con Shai Grammar o gramática de la forma? Yep. Y, si su, y si su método eh, puede aplicarlo a cualquier sintaxis geométrica plana. For example, los vitro de Frank your right. Okay. So the first question is what's the difference with or between your method and uh, shape grammars? What do you think is, is the difference? Mm -hmm. And the second one if, is if you can apply your method uh, to any uh, repeat me more of the, the description. Uh, la descripción. Sí. Eh, no, la descripción de la geometría. Como, ¿Qué tipo Cual, de geometría? Cualquier más? sintaxis geométrica plana, cualquier, a cualquier sintaxis geométrica plana, por ejemplo, a los vitro eh, que son contemporáneos a Mondrian de Fra Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, so if you can use your method for any uh, planar um, geometrical syntax, like for example, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, vitro or something like that. So that's the two questions. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Mauro, uh, muchas gracias para uh, traducir. <laughs> um, okay. um, uh, firstly, uh, uh, the, the way uh, we approach the segmentation and regeneration of a whole can be 
related to shape grammar. Maybe let's call it as relatives. Uh, but maybe uh, I could underline the difference in the um, um, closed system, being a closed system uh, in shape grammar's case. Here, um, it could lead more open-ended uh, axiom-based approach. Uh, actually, we have been uh, um, working with this segmentation uh, as a preparation of uh, if we could um, develop some machine learning methods over it. Uh, so uh, it was a kind of a layout for a um, maybe open-ended uh, exploration. Uh, in a shape grammar, um, it's a, still, a, yes, a cyclic system, but somehow a closed system uh, in, in my understanding. Uh, secondly, uh, it can be applied to not only planar system, any kind of information which can be representation, represented through um, uh, metri matrices. Uh, it can be also a kind of um, info uh, information or knowledge of uh, design uh, or space, spatial relations, uh, any kind of um, uh, etrogency. Uh, or topological relations, whatever can be represented through uh, pixels or voxels can be approached through uh, that kind of uh, metric space representation systems. Excellent. So yes, like... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Sema. Thank you very much. De nada. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was I was thinking about the the, the complex geometry of, of uh, Arabic tiles, for example, as a, as something that maybe can be also uh, analyzed or 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 simulate also. Um, but I have a, a question. Uh, we are getting to the end of the meeting, and I have a, a question for um, Lenka about this uh, last part uh, of uh, the fluid architecture, because when you was showing the city, uh, I mean, I know there are these this Soviet kind of blocks mm -hmm. there, but but I, I thought that it was kind of, a, um, I don't know, all rectangles in, in, in you know, cities can be uh, more geometrical, geometrically diverse. So um, I was thinking about uh, how to use other kind of geometries or how to use, for example, uh, generative adversarial networks to find new configurations, not, not only to state the configuration that the city, the city uh, actually have, but also to uh, create or find new configurations on, on the city to, to test this. But it's just uh, an open question. So do you mean to maybe modify the existing buildings and their um, geometry. Yeah, to, to try mm -hmm. to try another kind of geometries. Uh, to, because, uh, for example, I saw that you have there some kind of amphitheater, mm -hmm. uh, amphitheater or something like that. Um, and and for the simulation, I, I think that it's like you only take the blocks. I know why, but but mm -hmm. in a way, I, I'm asking myself if. Um, cannot be like interesting to uh, introduce another kind of geometries to understand better how the wind will um, behave in the simulations of or the redesign of, of the city. Yeah, so for this uh, fast machine learning tool, we cannot really use complex geometries. So that's why, as you said, uh, we, there, there were only boxy geometries and simplified geometries. But uh, in this case, we could play with, with those simplified shapes, maybe um, make other configurations to see how the wind flow um, goes through, through the new configurations in a larger scale. And if we want to test uh, these uh, fluid shapes, then I cannot really use uh, this machine learning tool. I, I need to use uh, still the more complicated uh, CFD tools, as I mentioned before, for example, butterfly for grasshopper or uh, procedural compute or other 
maybe you know ANSYS or there are some tools that are more complicated to use and for a more complicated geometry. So yeah. with this design tool infrared that, that I have introduced, uh, you cannot really test complex shapes, but you can make other configurations in urban design. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Lenka. Thank you very much, you all, for this beautiful session. And I think we reached the, the time limit and we will go to the next session now. So thank you very much. And I will see you there in the, in the conference. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mauro. For you. Muchas gracias, Mauro. No, seguimos, seguimos trabajando. Entonces, ¿quién es el siguiente moderador aquí? Está en grabación. No sé si hay que cortar la grabación o... Porque continúa, no, no, continúa, continúa, no te preocupes. Ah, ok, pasa perfecto. Esto es así, continuo, continuo. La siguiente yo, com mesa. yo comienzo clase ahora.